In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have brought us together to worship. You and your kingdom gives you praise and glory for all that you've done in our lives. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus who became that, that sin offering, that sin offering for us, that we might be forgiven, that we might be drawn closer to you into your heavenly sanctuary. Lord, we give you our praise and our time this day so that we may hear your word, that it may form us and continue to strengthen us. Father, we pray for Mina this day and we ask for your strength, your healing, your mercy upon her and her family. We pray for Missy, Lord, for the same mercy and protection, that your grace be upon her wherever she travels. Lord, that your mission for her this day and this week will just be ever present and before her. Lord, we ask you to place your angels around her, guarding her, keeping her safe from harm. Father, we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, come on. We have plenty of time. We'll take them. Come on, don't worry about it. <laughs> and we're going to play Let's Make a Deal. Come on down. <laughs> Door number two? Okay. Good morning. I am uh, your surrogate teacher today. Jay is uh, with uh, Mina, and they're having some time with her, which is good. Uh, and so what we're going to do today is we're going to attempt to go through chapters 8, 9, and 10. And I'll have a just brief summary of some things and we'll go right to the questions in the back. And we're going to have discussions on those and, and some of the readings as well. And then I've asked several others in the audience to look up a couple of scriptures because I want to make references to those and kind of give us a starting point for us in where we're going and what we're going to be doing. Um, so let's see. Chapter 7, just as a recap from last week, uh, we have a description of Jesus' Jesus' eternal priesthood. Now what we're going to see in chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10, this is the crux of Hebrews. Everything that's contained in what the Hebrew author is trying to convey is within these chapters right here. So this is very important for us to know and understand the relationship of Jesus uh, in uh, the, in the sacramental um, aspect of his life, in the covenant aspect of his life especially. Uh, so we're going to have some discussion on covenant. We'll have some on, on the differences between the use of covenant and will uh, in chapter 9. So we'll have an interesting discussion, hopefully. And please, we have uh, microphones now, so speak up. Uh, one thing somebody has mentioned to me, uh, that if you're on one side of the room, the other side of the room can't hear you as well. So if you aren't too afraid, you can stand up and ask your question, or if you want to make a statement, and if you can want to stand up, please do so. But please, at whatever, please uh, speak loudly and clearly so that the others can hear you as well. Otherwise, then I will have to be relegated to repeating everything to both sides of the audience. I can do that. I'll do it if I need to. Okay, um, I would like to open with uh, Luke chapter 22, I believe I told you, or... 22, yes. Starting with 19. Sure, please. And he took the bread and said the blessing, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. Okay, this cup is the new covenant and my blood, which will be shed for you. Important words to remember as we're going through Hebrews. Okay, who did I give 1 Corinthians to? Dana. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, beginning with the verses 23, I believe, and then going through 26. Okay, thank you. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took prayer. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do 
Okay. This is the foundation of what the author in Hebrews is trying to lay here, is that Jesus has established for us a new covenant. He's done so as a priest in the order of the order of Melchizedek. This is a priesthood that did not exist as the Hebrews had envisioned it up until this point in time. Because as we learned earlier, we have Moses coming down from Mount Sinai and he establishes a priestly order under who, what tribe? The Levites. So we have a Levitical priesthood who is active in the temple area, but does not have access into the inner part of the temple area, the Holy of Holies. What priesthood has that access? The high priest, right. And from what tribe does the high priest come from? Not Levi. Hmm. Uh, who? Aaron. Aaron. That's right, from Aaron. So we have a priestly order that Israel has been following that it shows uh, a tribal um, descendancy and it was stuck within that tribal descendancy. So your high priest come from Aaron, your uh, Levitical priest come from the lineage of Levi. Jesus came from neither of these. Okay? So when they said that, Je when the scriptures say that Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek, we now have a completely new order of priesthood. And this priesthood is a priesthood of service. Um, what happened, uh, and how, does, how did Melchizedek come about? Anybody summarize it? Where did, where did we hear about Melchizedek? Okay, from Abraham. And what did Abraham just finish? He was, um, it was in the book of Genesis. He, he, he did a battle and took his um, offering, his tithing to Melchizedek and laid it at his feet. To Salem, to where Melchizedek was, right? On the mount. Right. As, a, as an offering. Which is truly odd because Abraham, who was worshiping the one God, brings it to this king, priest king, Melchizedek, and gives him how much? Um, his tithe. A, yeah, a, te a tenth. 10%. Right, a tenth of what he had, had captured. That's right. And so he offered it. And what does Melchizedek do? Blessed him. He blessed him. Exactly. Interestingly. So he, he blesses him and he offers him what? Bread and wine, Bread and wine as a... As a, well, as a sacrificing type of meal, okay? So he offers this to him. So here we're having an introduction of what's to come, okay? In, in Catholic uh, scripture studies, we have, as St. Thomas, uh, Thomas Aquinas says, the literary, we always every, base everything off the literary tradition of scripture. But there are things that we have to consider what we call the wholeness of scripture, and it's important to bring into the wholeness of Scripture, which is what this author in Hebrews is doing. He is demonstrating for the audience that he is preaching this to, or he's preaching this homily to, that he is bringing in the corpus, the entirety of, of Scripture, into play here because he has to establish Jesus' role and how God intended Jesus' role. God the Father intended his son's role from the very beginning. And so what you'll see is how the literal portions of Scripture lead to the spiritual aspects of Scripture and the spiritual aspects of Jesus and how He exists in us today. Interesting that we have such beautiful Scriptures in our, in our readings today too because what you are going to see is how what happened in Jesus' uh, Last Supper is existing and happens today. And we'll get to that. But that's showing you that Jesus is timeless. He is for all eternity. And so when you read the literal portions of, uh, the, uh, in the scriptures, in the earlier scriptures, such as in Genesis, you'll see how the timelessness of Jesus exists and how it's unveiled to us through these authors as we read them. So in, in chapter 7, just as a recap, we see that Jesus is in a different order than what they 
we're uh, used to seeing under David and Aaron. He, he's contrasted with Aaron um, in, the way, in what way? That he has no need to do what? To make a sacrifice for himself. Right. So Aaron, uh, the lineage of Aaron, the high priest, before he could make a sacrifice for the people, he had to first make a sacrifice for his own sins. He had to make a sacrifice for his self. Jesus didn't have to do that. Uh, so he is different from the high priest in that regard. Um, in fact, he does that sacrifice for the people once and for all. Once and for all. And today we're living, if you went to communion today, you're living in that sacrifice. Today, that once and for all sacrifice exists today for us. Jesus abolished forever both the Levitical priesthood and the law it serves because neither could effectively sanctify the people. It's by His blood that we have this salvific grace. We have the true forgiveness of our sins, the wiping away. It's not just a covering over of our sins and hiding it. It's an eradication of it. It's like a flood coming a tree that once existed on the side of the bank, if you could represent that tree as sin, for example, and this flood coming and wiping that tree away. So once the water resides, that tree no longer exists there. Same thing in Jesus. As he is forgiven us of our sins, he is completely wiping it away. Now, the effects of sins could still be prevalent in our lives, but the sin itself has been wiped completely away. It's not a covering of it. It is gone. He turns his head away from it. The Father no longer sees that sin. It's completely gone. So when we enter into these scriptures, we have to enter into a grace. When we enter into what sacrament that we share in, uh, in forgiveness? The sacrament of what? Reconciliation. When we enter into the sacrament of reconciliation, we enter into that grace with an expectant faith that it is complete. that sin has been completely wiped away. We start anew. We start anew. So that what we did in the past is no longer an issue. It's no longer something that should be um, born in our minds, our thoughts, and the pain of that. We've forgiven, we have been forgiven for those sins. Leslie. Well, I'm going to go to confession. I'll say I'm sorry for that, and then I can go back and do it again the next day. It's not what it's about. It's about learning from that, <coughs> from that, and staying away from that. Right. There's there's some characterizations that have developed through the years that some people say, "Well, I better go to confession now for what I'm going to do this weekend." <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's that, that is not that is not, and it's it's comical. People say those things, but that is not our understanding. Our understanding is a metanoia. It is a turning. It is a Greek term that says you're turning 180 degrees from the direction that you were going in. And you're going in the other direction. You're turning away from that life. We're turning away. In fact, Hebrews talks about that when we get to chapter 10. Yes? I think there are also graces that are delivered with the sacrament of reconciliation. Like Jesus said, if you Absolutely, absolutely. So, Jesus, who is our new high priest, if you recall, we discussed last week briefly, at his passion and death, what event happened to the curtain in the Holy of Holies? It was torn, ripped from top to bottom. The heavenly tear, I call it. Okay, that's why it's written, ripped from top to bottom because it was from the heavenly tear, not from the manly tear or the earthly tear from the bottom to up to the top. So what we're seeing here is that Jesus now is that high priest who can make that um, expiation for our sins with us in his presence. With us 
in his presence. That could not happen before because only who could enter into the Holy of Holies? Only the high priest. That's right. So what he did was in awe of the people because they couldn't see what was going on. But Jesus has torn that and has now made it available for all of us so that we are experiencing that same expiation of our sins, that same pouring out of his blood and celebrating it today. That's why I had Sister Flo and Sister Dana read from those scriptures so that you saw from the beginning Jesus' intent was that his blood was being poured out for us for a new covenant. A covenant that's different than what was expressed in the earlier covenant by Moses. What was Moses' covenant of? Stone. Well, blood uh, of stone, the Ten Commandments on the stones, and then of blood sacrifice. That was an imperfect sacrifice. It was an imperfect um, he, uh, healing or an imperfect forgiveness. Jesus' blood was a perfect healing, a perfect forgiveness. And when I say healing, think of it in terms of this. Sin is like a painful wound. And what Jesus is doing is he's healing your sinfulness. He's healing your body. He's restoring you to the wholeness back into his life, back into his community, back into his body. So when I, I use the term forgiveness and healing interchangeably in that regard. So understand that's why I use that is because we're being healed as a people and we're being brought back into the fold. So chapter eight, we have the new covenant is now superior to the old. So if we can start by reading with chapter eight, um, who would like to read first? Reading chapters, uh, let's read verse 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we get, you're in Psalm 110. If you can read Psalm 110, verse 4, please. Okay, just verse 4? Yes. Okay, uh, this is a Psalm of David, uh, Psalm 110. So the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a perfect, you are a priest forever after the order of. Uh, Melchizedek? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, so again, the stepping stone where we're going to on this. So who would like to read verse 1? Okay, please. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, minister in the sanctuary in the true tent, which is set up not by man, but by the Lord. Continue. Oh, please go ahead. We'll go to four. Stop at four. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Okay. Right there. Thank you. Now, uh, going to our questions in the back of the book, what function does the citation of Psalm 110 serve in Hebrews? His validity to Christ as a high priest. Right. His announcement. Okay. It's like, it's the preface. It's the foreshadowing of what's to come. So, in the literal sense, we're hearing of a high priest, Melchizedek. But in the spiritual sense, it's leading us to this new Messiah who is going to come serve in the same capacity. So that there was a foreshadowing that's being foretold to us. So its purpose then is what's being told to come, right? Okay. As a messianic psalm, what? Uh, oh, we were, we, just, we covered that. Okay. So verse four. Who wants to read verse four? Okay. Lesson. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy shadow of the heavenly sanctuary, for when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has attained a ministry which is as much more excellent than the old, than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on... Of better promises. Let me 
Uh, keep going. We'll uh, ver finish verse 7. Okay. For if that first covenant had been flawless, there would have been no occasion for a second. Okay, so once again, why would Jesus not be accepted typically as a priest? He wasn't a Levite. Right. He wasn't a Levite. As a high priest, he wasn't uh, of the tribe of Aaron. That's right. Lineage of Aaron. Correct. Okay, verse 8. Anybody? Well, oh, sure. 8 through 12, please. <coughs> For he finds fault with them when he says, The days will come, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant in the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with the fathers. On the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, and they do not continue in my covenant. And so I pay no heed to them, says the Lord. And this is the covenant that I will make with them, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach every one his fellow or every other his brother, saying, No, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest. I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sin no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he treats the first as obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and going old is ready to vanish away. Okay. So, according to Jeremiah, what are the qualities of the new covenant that uh, he is prophesying about? long before Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. So what are the qualities, this new quality in this new covenant that he is uh, speaking about? What's the first one? Um, no, that's not the quality. That's more of his lineage. How about, um, where does... Uh, Ah, the first one is it will not be broken. Okay, the first quality of this. Whereas in the previous covenant, we showed what was the purpose of the high priest going into the Holy of Holies every year? Had to renew it every year. Every year because of its brokenness. Okay, in this case, Jesus does it how many times? Once. So, the first quality of this new covenant is that it's not broken. Okay? So, it will not be broken, but it will last forever. Which, today, as we celebrate in Mass, as we read earlier, that same quality of that covenant, that new covenant, we're living in. We participate in. Uh, we've had discussions, for example, on anamnesis. We've talked about living in the present, what happened in the past, still exists with us. And that's exactly what's happening here. So that is an unbroken covenant. It's an unbroken uh, promise on that. So the first quality is that. Okay. A second quality of this. Think of it in terms of how it's written. Okay. So it's faulty. So it's imperfect. Uh, and, and, and part of it's being broken as part of that. So it's an aspect of that, certainly. Okay, what else? Yeah. Dan? No, he says it's going to be in your heart, ah. not on a stone tablet. That's right. Being in totally. That's right. It's, 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 it's written in your heart. Okay, the law is written in your heart, and you're not required the stone tablet. We know because... Who places that in our heart? Through, through what vehicle? The Holy through the Holy Spirit. Grace. That's right. That's why when I mentioned that when you're going into the sacrament of reconciliation, you're going with grace, with expectant grace. Okay? You're expecting a change to occur in your 
in your faith, a change to occur in your being because of that being restored or being healed. So here, that law now being written in our heart is a change because the Holy Spirit, at what time, where does that first occur to us? Where does the, the law and the grace come to us first? In baptism, exactly. So the sprinkling of the water, the dipping of the water, we experience that grace in an overpowering way. And it's not man who's creating that. For example, let's look at the tabernacle and the, and the uh, place of worship. In the days of old, it was created by man, right? All the objects were created, the tents, everything was created by man. The order of it was all created by man. In today, uh, what we are experiencing today, who creates that tabernacle? Who creates that temple for us? Who? Go ahead, you raise your hand. Who creates the temple for us? <laughs> absolutely, from the mouth of babes. God. So her answer is God, and that's absolutely right. God is providing for us a new temple. God is providing for us that covenant. God is providing for us. Think about those words. Where did we first hear those words in Scripture? Genesis. Genesis. Exactly. What did he do for Adam and Eve? That's right. He provided for their very needs. Think about this now. Think about this. So, this new covenant with Jesus, this temple that we're referring to now, this grace that we've had, what's God's will? To do what for us? To grow. Okay, to provide. Okay, to provide for us. Everything that we need. In essence... From the very beginning, that has always been his will. It's always been his will to provide for us in all ways. It's our will coming into a crashing or colliding disruption when we turn from him and sin. We're saying that our will is higher than his will. Our needs are greater than his needs. So what we're having is a conflict that's going on of wills. So we know the truth is, is that is his will for us is to provide for us in all ways and all things. So he's restoring us constantly, everlasting through his covenant, his new covenant. Okay, that new covenant of grace. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the second part. So the law is written in our hearts. Good one. The law is written in our hearts. Uh, how about a third one? Absolutely. Absolutely. The knowledge. The issue is knowledge now. So that the knowledge of God will be so generally known in the life of the people that it will no longer be necessary to put it into words of instruction. Isn't this like a maturity thing? I mean, if you look at it, when you have little children, you have set rules, you don't do this, you have time out. You have to go to bed at 7 o'clock, you have to do this. In the Mosaic Law, there are actually 300 and some odd laws that they would, I mean, about their food, their drink, how they slaughtered their animals. All of these were to protect them because it's like they were little children. And now we're coming to a maturity through the years from the first time we acknowledged the fact that there was one God until the covenant of Jesus. So this is a brand new adult covenant. I mean, it takes an understanding that all of you are different. You have all this history that has brought you to this point where now you, you've reached a point where you can take this on. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I couldn't have said it better because if you go back to the early part of Hebrews, what was the author trying to say to them? That you are no longer what? Children. You're no longer children. You're no longer babes. The things that we need to talk about now need to move you on into the next phases of your life. 
And it was important because what was the circumstances surrounding the community uh, that this author was addressing? They were converting from, they were, they were starting to believe that, that Christ was truly the Messiah. And they were trying to figure out, if they, they were in the middle of kind of like a, a Jewish conflict to where they either, either the new Christians had to become Jews or they didn't have to become Jews. That they, that they didn't have to take on Jewish law. And these were the Jews that already knew the law and knew the prophecies and knew the scripture and knew, knew the, the heritage of the Jewish people. And then he was just trying to help them along to, to kind of reiterate what they believed in Christ. Right. They... They, he was, the author was fearing an apostasy that was occurring, that he started to sense that they were starting to bring the Jewish cult back into, or the Israel, yeah, the Jewish cult back into play here, that they were having to resort back to other um, traditions, other um, forms of, of um, justification them through Jesus. They were also becoming somewhat slothen in their, in their uh, faith. They weren't coming to the Sabbath. They weren't performing, they weren't doing the things that they should be doing as mature adult Christians. They were uh, stepping aside. They were becoming lazy, I guess, if you want to use that term. So this author was concerned about that, and that's why he takes us, or she, um, but most likely it's he, this author takes us to a new level of understanding of the faith uh, in terms of its Jewish heritage. Yes? It talks about in the beginning of this time for all of a sudden, that what Jesus offered us better promises. That we didn't have to live by all of those 300 and whatever it was, that we couldn't live by anyway. And it's open to all people, you know, that these are truly better promises we can understand who Jesus is. Everything that we read about in Scripture in the Old Testament is bringing about the fullness of Jesus Christ. All the prophets. You know, you go back starting with Hosea and you read and you see Jeremiah as we're reading here in this author as you read Ezekiel. I even, I even pulled out a section of Ezekiel that just really, in fact, let me just bring that out here. I'll just paraphrase it real quick. He's talking about the regeneration of, his, of the people. Within their sight, I prove my holiness through you. I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you. From all your impurities and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you. I will save you from all of your impurities. Then you shall remember your evil conduct and that your deeds were not good. You shall loathe yourselves for your sins and your abominations. Thus says the Lord God, when I purify you, from all your crimes, I will repeople re the cities and the ruins shall be rebuilt. So here we're seeing, and that was Ezekiel, by the way, if you were interested, Ezekiel chapter 36. Um, you're seeing how the scriptures are telling us that Jesus is, all the prophecies are leading to the perfection in Jesus, in our relationship with him. So that um, the knowledge of God is, through Jesus, is perfect. Um, as, well, your daughter's not there, as she was saying, there were faults in, 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 er, in our earlier uh, understandings. Now, through Jesus, there are no faults. He perfects what the scriptures have foretold. Okay, so we're seeing, these are the, these are the uh, attributes of this new covenant uh, that Jeremiah prophesied about and that the author of Hebrews is bringing about to us. Now, how does Catholic worship, which uses symbols and sacramental signs, differ from the Mosaic worship done according to the pattern that we've read about, about you know, the description of the tent and everything? How does it differ? We don't have the blood sacrifice. We don't have the blood sacrifice. And I believe our young babe here, the difference, the main difference is who gives it to us? God. All of the things that we require in terms of symbolization, all the things that we require in terms of prayer, um, all the things that we require in terms of regeneration, all the things that we require in terms of expiation for our sins are all given by whom now? 
by God and not by man's creation of this. In essence, that's why Flo and Dana read those scriptures. I had to read those just as reminders to us is who establishes that. For example, who establishes our Eucharist, our, our, our new blood covenant? It's Christ who's doing it for us. So the Son, the Son of God is the one who brings us to, to this perfection. Yes, Dana? Yes, that's not a symbolic, but we do use symbols and sacramentals, but they're, it's not the same in that regard. For example, the Eucharist is not a symbol of it. It is the body and blood of Christ. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Which is that word? The anamnesis? Yes. Yeah. It's not... That's absolutely right. In fact, uh, for those who aren't Catholic here, so that you understand what we're talking about in that terms, in Passover, the Jews celebrated the saving, their saving, their Passover of death. The firstborn of their families were going to live and survive because they sacrificed the lamb, they spread the blood from the sacrifice over the doorway, Okay, and they ate of the food, they ate of the meal and the unleavened bread. And in doing that, the, the angel passed over them and their firstborn son survived. To this day, they still celebrate Passover as an event that although it occurred back then, they're living it today. They're living that event today. So they're taking that present they're taking into the present what occurred in the past. Jesus is doing the same thing. In fact, when he institutes the, uh, the Eucharist, at what feast was he instituting this? Passover. At Passover. So it's very appropriate, appropriate that he's using the corpus of Scripture. He's using all of Scripture for his glory, the glory of his Father. So he's showing to us today how important it is to re, not relive, but to live that moment. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me is not a one-time event. It's not a one-time event at all. It's an event that continues to occur. If it were a one-time event, why was Paul giving the description of that in 1 Corinthians? which was years later after Jesus' Jesus's death, passion, death, and resurrection. So if it were a one-time event, Paul wouldn't be celebrating that. The early church fathers wouldn't be teaching that. So you wouldn't see instructions, which is the instructions that we have today that are carried on. The tradition that we have today is in the literal interpretation of the Scripture. As St. Thomas Aquinas says, the corpus of the scriptures are based on the literal translation of the scriptures. And that's what we're doing today. So as Catholics, we are performing the literal instruction of Jesus. We are taking his body and his blood. Okay. So that is, um, these are the characteristics that we were talking about in this new covenant that it's being perfected in. Uh, let's read, uh, let's see, chapter, that was, cha and that was uh, from Jeremiah. Let's go on to chapter uh, 9. Worship of the first covenant. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was constructed, the outer one in which uh, where the lampstand, lamp stand, the table and the bread of offering... This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil was the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies in which were the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant entirely covered with gold. In it were the gold jar containing the manna, the staff of Aaron that had sprouted and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the place of expiation. Now is not the time to speak of these in detail. With these arrangements for worship, the priests in performing their service go into the outer tabernacle repeatedly. But the high priest alone goes into the inner one once a year, with not without blood that he offers for himself and for the sins of the people. 
In this way, the Holy Spirit shows that the way into the sanctuary had not yet been revealed, while the outer tabernacle still had its place. This is a symbol of the present time in which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect a worshiper in conscience, but only in matters of food and drink and various ritual washings. Regulations concerning the flesh imposed until the time of the new order. In essence, in summary, he is saying these are dead works. You're guessing? Uh, just a question. Sure. Is, is it possible that this was written before 70 AD, before the fall of the yeah, because, because of the reference to the temple. Uh, that's a good point that Leslie brings out. Again, let's look at it from the scriptures. Uh, the approximation of when this occurs. Some say it occurs after the fall of the temple. This particular scripture right here alludes to the fact that they're speaking in terms that the temple is still existing. So it's be, it could be before 70 AD. The scriptures here in Hebrews, this homily that he's providing to them, was probably a very good foreshadowing of what was to come. Okay, so it could have been in preparation. Nobody, you know, they did not know that the temple was going to be destroyed by the Romans. However, this scripture, when you look back historically at it, it was a foreshadowing. That he's preparing them that don't fall back into the Jewish cult. Don't fall back into apostasy. There is so much more. It's so much greater that we have to look forward to because of the perfection that Jesus did through his own sacrifice, through his own blood. So we don't fall back into that. So I think it's, it's a good point to bring out that this probably, probably occurred before the temple destruction. Yeah, could be, yeah. That, again, it's, it, it's becoming obsolete. Who makes it obsolete actually occurred by Jesus, who made it obsolete. So whether the temple was still standing today or not, the convenience is the temple wasn't there, or, or well, is not there today. But the fact is that Jesus is coming, whether it's still there or not, is still made it obsolete. He still made it obsolete. Okay. You know, I think another thing that's really important here is not only explaining about the new covenant, but another big problem for a Jewish person is he had grown up, his whole history had been that the covenant was between the Jews and God. And what's happening at this time, as we know, it's not just the Jews who are accepting the teachings of Christ. It's the Gentiles, the people who the Jewish people were raised to think of as being unclean, like the Samaritans in these stories. And, and through this, you keep hearing him say, it's open to all. Mm -hmm. And because I'm sure that if you thought that you were the only big guy that's going to get into the country club, you might get real resentful when they let the Indian chief in. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And, and that was a big thing. And I think St. Paul addresses that uh, in his epistles, too, about, mm -hmm. you know, in the controversy about uh, how you be circumcised and all this other kind of stuff. And because their beginning understanding mm -hmm. of accepting Jesus was they were still Jews who were accepting another covenant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Later, and it, in a sense that they realized and it was difficult. It was Sure, of their faith. And and for the Jews, they were being asked to strip themselves of something that had been ingrained into their culture. Not just a personal relationship, but into their cultural sense. So when they accepted Christ as the new covenant, they literally were pulling themselves out of their culture and going into a new culture, which is why they experienced suffering. Not only 
from their brothers, but also from their overseers, their overlords. So there was a suffering on all parts because they were literally drawing themselves out. They were separating themselves from their known society. Now, in this chapter 9, basically we've covered most of it in our discussions earlier that Jesus as a new high priest, this is God's ordained will. This is God's will from the very beginning because Jesus is making this um, sacrifice with his own blood. He's, in fact, th what's interesting is we're going to read in chapter 10 uh, the requirements for a sacrifice through Jesus. In fact, why don't we go to that? Leslie, can you read chapter 5? I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 5 through 7, please. In Hebrews? Yes, please. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body has you prepared for me. In birth offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me, in the of okay, so from the very beginning, Jesus is telling us that this has been the will of God to perform. All right. So in in your in your uh, footnotes, for example, what I'd like to point out to you in your in your footnotes on that page, if you look down at the bottom of it, what are the requirements? Four things that must be considered with every sacrifice. To whom the sacrifice is being offered to, right? So who is the sacrifice being offered to? Let's take Jesus' death and, and, and on the cross. To whom is the sacrifice being offered to? That's right. What's the criteria of to whom? Okay. What is another, uh, another thing that's considered with the sacrifice? By whom? Who is, do, who is doing this? Christ himself. Okay, this is interesting. Think about it. If Christ is God... In this case, we actually have God sacrificing himself. Okay? So it's no longer somebody doing it on behalf of, uh, or, or he's, he's, he's using something. He's not using something else as a sacrifice. He's not using a calf. He's not using a goat. He's using himself. So we have uh, the first two things is we know it's being, he's being offered to God the Father. It's, he's offering himself. The third thing is what is being offered. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, what is being offered, it's himself. So Jesus, the Son of God, is offering himself. So we have three aspects of the sacrifice being met there. The fourth one is for whom is the sacrifice being offered for? For us. It says in Romans, he bore our stripes for our transgressions. So, Jesus is become that one sacrifice for us. He has done this blood sacrifice. So he's created that, and as a result of that new covenant, he's, 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 he's done it with blood. He's done it with his blood. So in that new covenant that he's established, he's sealed it for us once and for all, forever. So in chapter 10, let's see. We find that this expression that Jesus is referring to here is what God has intended all along. Now let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. After man fell, they ate of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of life. Jesus said, did, what did he do? Or not Jesus, God, what did he do for them? Hmm? He clothed them. Okay, And yet he promised them that he would take care of them in the future. Even though there was a curse associated with what happened, he still cared for them. Okay? Folks, that's what he's doing for us here in Hebrews right now. Uh, the author of Hebrews is telling us that God has willed that what we see in Jesus from the very beginning. When you go back, when you read Hebrews, go back and read the beginning. Read creation, not the creation story. Go back and read the... Uh, rise and the fall of Adam and Eve. Okay, read that in context with what you're reading in Hebrews in, in chapters 8, 9, and 10. And you will see how the corpus of scriptures are coming to fruition. When you read through Jeremiah and the other prophets, you'll see how they foretold of what Jesus is doing here. The foreshadowing of his expiation for our sins. And, and this has been 
promised to us is now being lived. And then now, step back and look at it, we're living it today. We're experiencing it today. It was not just a one-time event. It was not just for then. It's for now. So it's getting close to our time so that those who need to go to Mass at 11, we're going to stop in time for that. So we've covered up through the first part of Chapter 10 on this. Ugh, amazingly. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll have to report to Jay. He can take off from... What did we finish on Chapter 10? 12? Was Verse 12? 8? Okay, so we'll mark that as where we finished off. Okay, so uh, are there any questions or any thoughts before we close? Okay, let's do so in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the words that you brought to us, the love that you shared for, uh, with us through your Son, Jesus, who brought to us a new covenant, a new covenant signed in his blood, for us, a new covenant with you. Lord, that we live out this covenant with you each day of our lives. That we seek you and your highest good and your will for us each day of our lives. We ask, Father, that your grace, the grace of your salvation, prepare us today and for all days this week. That we go forth into your kingdom, proclaiming your glories, proclaiming your word, proclaiming your truth. To all those around us, Lord. We ask this, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Awesome.